you um, are new here, uh, it's wonderful to have you with us. My name is Simon. I'm one of the pastors here, and I've been at this church um, about 11 years since I joined as a student at Royal Holloway. So um, if you're a student with us, it's so good to have you with us. Um, we're excited that you're kind of here and looking around churches or with us. Um, but as we um, begin this morning, Jonna said we are today starting a, a new teaching series. Uh, it's a teaching series that's going to lead up all, all the way up to uh, Christmas, and we've called it Teach Us to Pray. And so if you haven't guessed, it's a series on learning together to pray, to come to God in prayer, as Martin's always already prompted us to. Uh, and um, as with all teaching series we do here, there are kind of a number of kind of reasons behind this. Uh, one goes back a couple weeks. If you remember, uh, Joe shared with us a few weeks ago that we have a vision as a church to be a church of, of deep disciples. Disciples just being people who follow Jesus with their lives, whose lives look like Jesus's. And of course, one thing that really defined Jesus's life was that he was a man of prayer. And so we need to learn to pray. Uh, also, going back last week, uh, you'll remember we shared that as a church, we feel God calling us to kind of take a step forward in reaching out to our community with the gospel. And as part of that, we're even going to be having a gift day in a few weeks' time to kind of raise funds to renovate our building for uh, outreach activities and initiatives we can start. Uh, but here's the thing. Uh, Jesus says, he says, if you're going to bear fruit, he says, without me, without abiding in me, you can do nothing. And so if we want to see gospel fruit as a church, it's important we come to Jesus. We learn to pray. Um, but if I could be really kind of personal and open with you for a moment this morning, um, for me, there's, a, there's an even deeper reason for this series, which actually goes back longer than two weeks, almost goes back years. Uh, because I would say that over the, the past sort of five or so years of my life, um, God has been on a mission, really, to reveal to me my own weakness to reveal to me my, my frailty and my need of him. Um, and I, you know, when I preach, I try not to talk about myself too much because you know, my life's no more important than any of yours, but I, I'd like to, if it's okay, just share some of my experience over the past few years. Not because I actually feel that my experience is particularly noteworthy or unique, but because it may resonate with a number of us and where we are this morning. And so this experience kind of began in, uh, I would say, uh, 2019, uh, when I became an elder of this church, uh, which was, of course, uh, a huge desire that I had had since I was young, really. It came sooner than I'd expected, but it was a real blessing to be invited to, to join the team of pastors we have here. Um, but even b before I joined uh, the eldership, I, I was kind of realizing the immense responsibility that I would carry there. And I can remember, you know, soon after I beca became an elder, that uh, people from the church, namely you, <laughs> would come to me sometimes with questions about God or about the church, about our stance on things, uh, maybe questions even about painful circumstances. And I just had this realization, I, I, I'm not sure I've got the wisdom <laughs> to deal with all of this. And then, of course, 2019 led into 2020, which was a you know, huge year for all of us. The COVID pandemic hit, and that meant for us as a church that we had to work out how to do church online. Um, and because of the grace of God and really the amazing gifts of our staff team here, I think we weathered that storm pretty well. But I would still say that for us as elders and for me personally, there were many times when we had a decision to make, and I thought, I'm, I'm just not sure of the, r the right way to go here. I'm not sure what the right decision is here. The year after that, 2021, Eliz and I were blessed with our, our first child, Judah. And if I didn't feel out of my depth before that point, uh, I certainly did then. And you kind of, it, when you begin parenting, you read these parenting books, and one of the things they talk to you about is like the formative influence parents have in those early years. <laughs> I'm thinking... I can barely stay awake to, to read him a book, let alone kind of form his character, and so I'm like, I need help here. 
The, the year after that, 2022, uh, you may remember we had one of our pastors here, Dave Rogers. He felt a call to go and lead a church in Exeter. And in 2023, the next year, him and his family moved down there to follow that call, uh, which left me kind of carrying a bit more responsibility in our staff team and as a pastor here. And again, thinking, have I, have I got the wherewithal to, to kind of juggle all these things? And then to, to top it all off in 2024, Eliz and I were blessed with another baby, Cohen. You probably heard him this morning when people were trying to pray. He's got quite a mouth on him. And so I've just kind of found myself over these past five years, just my responsibility in the home, outside the home, it's kind of just going up and up and up. And let me be very clear, I'm not complaining about this this morning. Eliz and I have known God's blessing kind of at at each of those stages, but... I would say that one kind of key theme of God's work in my life over these years has been him showing me my, n- my weakness. He's been showing me my frailty and my need. I can remember one morning uh, opening up Psalm 6 just to pray through it. And I just got stuck on verse 2, which come up on the screen. It just says this, Be gracious to me, Lord, for I am weak. And I just <laughs> stopped there because I thought, that, that is my heart's cry. I am weak, Lord. I need your help. And, and the one thing that Eliz and I have both found Eliz leading us to, uh, uh, has both found God leading us to kind of over these years is this one realization that we need to pray. We need to learn to pray. Not because it's the right thing to do, not because we're Christians and that's what Christians should do, but even more deeply than that, we need to pray because I just, I can't see how I will get through the next, you know, however many years God gives me without that. We need to pray. And let me say, I I know that your life will be very different to mine. And I know that the things God is doing in your life will be very different to what he's doing in me right now. But I do feel that there is something of a kind of common human experience in that story. Kind of, we've all had that experience of kind of facing up to to life's demands and thinking, have I got it in me? Feeling kind of overwhelmed by what we're carrying. Maybe it's just your to-do list is just yards long and you're thinking, I don't know how to juggle all these plates, all of these responsibilities. Or maybe for you, it's, it's actually more the opposite. Maybe you're in a moment of life where you're not kind of carrying, like maybe you've transitioned from uni to work or you're kind of tr- empty nesting or something like you're kind of moving life stage and you're thinking, I'm not sure what I'm meant to do right now. You know, how should I spend my time? Where should I live? What sort of job should I be looking for? And kind of just paralyzed by the decisions. And other of, of us still will be in this room and just walking through really painful things right now and if that matches our experience at all it a series on prayer might sound like the last thing you need you know might you might be thinking great uh, another burden I've got to carry you know not only have I got to carry all of these things but now I've got to pray as well but here's the thing what we hope to see in this series what I believe we will discover in this series is that prayer is really not just another burden for you to carry but really prayer is like a a doorway it's like a doorway into the place where you can lay your burdens down it's a doorway into the life you were made for a life of abundance a life of joy a life of peace it's not another brick for you to carry it's a place where you can lay it down and so what we're going to do over this series is just come to Jesus and say, Lord, would you teach us how to pray? And now we're, the way we're going to begin this morning is, uh, I'm going to pray, <laughs> and then uh, we're just going to take a journey through the story of the Bible, actually, so that we can kind of understand the whole story of prayer right from the beginning to the end. And then we're going to kind of find where we are in the story. And then 
finishing that, we're then just going to consider how, going forward, we can learn to practice prayer in our daily lives. So we're going to go through the story and then find out where are we now and how can we continue. Or if you like points in sermons, we're just going to see four things. We're firstly going to see our need for prayer. We're then going to see our loss of prayer. Uh, Finally, we're going to see how Jesus restores us to prayer. And then lastly, we're going to look at our practice of prayer. But firstly, let me pray. (laughs) Why don't we just still our hearts before God again. Lord God, we receive your welcome to us this morning. And we, we take it up. Lord Jesus, we hear you knocking on the door of our lives and we let you in. And we say, Lord God, would you come and do what you would with us this morning? Would you speak to us by your word? Would you give us a vision for the life you have for us? And Lord, would we be changed by hearing your voice this morning? In your name, amen. Amen. Can I ask... Uh, do we have any Coldplay fans in the room here? Anyone willing to admit? I've got I've got quite five hands there. The rest of you are Coldplay fans. You're just too embarrassed to admit it. Um, a quick question for, for all of us, I guess. Uh, does anyone know what their latest single release is called? We Pray. Look, Liz gets the right answer. <laughs> the pastor's wife. There you go. Um, <laughs> I'd like to just read you the the chorus of Coldplay's latest release, okay? This song was released in August 2024, and the chorus goes like this. It goes, and so we pray, pray that we make it to the end of the day. And so we pray, I know that somewhere heaven is waiting. And so we pray, because I know that somewhere there's something amazing. Just consider the significance of those words with me for a moment. This is a a kind of secular band in a post-Christian nation in the year 2024. And what are they singing about? They're singing about prayer. They're singing about reaching out to kind of some higher power in prayer. And as you can see on the the picture on the right, this isn't just kind of Coldplay's thing. But actually, if you can go on YouTube and watch uh, Glastonbury this year, thousands of people kind of joining in with this, with th- this hymn, saying, and so we pray, we need to pray. It's astonishing, isn't it? I bet a small fraction of those people would say they're followers of Jesus, and yet there's this inbuilt need to pray. And actually, it's, it's not just a kind of a cold play thing, this, but actually, again, if you go online and look at the statistics, since the year 2020, it has been repeatedly found that between 25 and 30% of people living in Britain would say they pray once a month or more. Even though just a fraction of those people would call themselves Christians or religious in some way, almost a third of our country are praying once a month. That's astonishing. I think that should be astonishing. This is a country that is largely moving away from its Christian foundations, and yet we can't leave prayer behind. If anything, prayer is kind of having a bit of a revival. You say, why is that? Why is it that no matter how far we get from God, we we still find ourselves praying, praying to something even if we don't know what it is? Well, the Bible has a, a very clear answer to that question. And it's this first point we're going to see this morning that, quite simply, you and I need to pray. You and I were built to run on a relationship with God. And so if we lose it, it's like this need constantly gnawing away at us. We were built to pray. And to see this, I'd just like to to open up the first few chapters of the Bible with you. Uh, And we're just going to look at Genesis 1 right now. And This is where God kind of creates humans for the first time. And what we see is that God creates humans in his image and then gives them a huge responsibility. So Genesis 1, 27 and 28 says this. God created man in his own image. 
He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. And then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. Just think about those words for a moment. There are a lot of people in this room who have very significant jobs. You are responsible for a lot in your workplace or your home or wherever you find yourselves. But I don't think any of us could quite match up to this. You know, being responsible for literally every plant and animal on the earth. That is quite a big responsibility that God gives to these first two humans here. And yet, what we see as we kind of continue in this story is that there was a way they were able to manage this huge responsibility. And what was it? It was prayer. It was kind of constant communion, relationship with the God who gave them this responsibility. So if we just turn the page into Genesis 3, looking at verse 7, uh, oh sorry, verses 8 and 9, I think, it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And so the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, where are you? What we get in these verses is a, um, just a glimpse of what life in the garden was meant to be like. It seems that kind of in the evening, the evening breeze, the cool of the day, God would kind of come to the garden, come and meet with Adam and Eve as they had this huge responsibility, and they would, they would talk. When he can't find them, he says, where are you? We, we, we've got our meeting, we've got our time to, to catch up, to talk. This is what you and I were, were made for, the Bible says. Made, yes, to carry huge responsibility in God's world, but to carry it how? Through relationship with him. But as you can even see in those words just there, something has gone wrong. There is a problem here in these verses, which is what? That Adam and Eve, when God comes, they hide. You say, what, why are they hiding from, from the God that made them? Well, if, if you know the story, it's because a few moments before this point, uh, we read about a snake who entered the garden and kind of deceived Adam and Eve into breaking partnership with God, turning away from him and doing things their own way. And then sadly, when God comes looking for them, what they do is they don't kind of come to him in repentance saying, we're sorry, can we make this right? Instead, they run further from him. And this is actually the Bible's diagnosis of where all human beings find themselves right now. We were made for God. We were made to kind of spend our life in communion with him. We were made for prayer, and yet we have lost Instead of knowing him, we are far from him. And here's the thing. Doesn't that explain so much? It explains why, as we've seen already, that as human beings, we can't help but try and pray. It explains why wherever you go in the world, however religious or irreligious that nation is, people will always be searching for something. They will always be praying to someone, even if they don't know who that is. It's why, as in the words of that Coldplay song, we know there's something amazing. Even if our kind of minds tell us not, that's not true, there's kind of this uh, echo in our hearts of what we were really made for. There's this kind of faint memory of how you and I were made for God, the relationship with him in the garden. It's why we can't help but pray because actually we were built for it and we've lost it. But I think it also explains something else really significant for all of us to consider. Which is why is it that we're so overwhelmed in our lives? Is it because we carry too much responsibility? That we're doing too many things? Well, you might think that's the case, but what we see of Adam and Eve is that they had huge responsibility. 
Now, what this story suggests to us is that the reason we are overwhelmed is not because of what we carry, but it's because we carry it alone. Because we're all trying to just carry it by ourselves when we were made to daily bring it to God in prayer. And I can't think of any kind of uh, thing that sums this up better than one of the verses from a hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. It'll come up on the screen. It just says this. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we don't carry everything to God in prayer. This is the Bible's diagnosis of the human condition. Built to know God. Built for relationship with him. Built to partner with him for great things. And yet, crushed because we have lost our source of connection with him. But here's the thing, that, that's only the beginning of the story. Because what we see in the very next verses of this part of the Bible is that God is keen to restore us to prayer. And so in the rest of Genesis 3, God promises how he's going to bring a savior who's going to crush the snake and save the man and the woman back into relationship with him. And then the rest of the Old Testament story is all about God preparing hinting about how this great savior is going to come and then when we turn our pages into the new testament we meet him we meet the character of jesus and what is one of the first things we see about this man is that he is a man of prayer he is a man who carries immense responsibility and yet how can he do it it's because that connection between him and God, for him, it isn't broken. It's functioning. And so in Luke, just to give one example, Luke 5, verses 15 to 16, it says this, the crowds about him spread even more, uh, sorry, the news about him spread even more. And large crowds would come together to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. This picture of Jesus kind of under immense pressure. And yet, it says he often withdrew to deserted places and prayed. Jesus here is living what we were all made to live, carrying responsibility for God and yet doing it with God. But here's the thing, as we go through the story of Jesus, what we find is that he has not just come to kind of be an example to us of how to live, to kind of show us what we're missing. Actually, he has come to invite us into what he has. He's come to restore us to the place of prayer he has with the Father. And I could go to any number of verses to show you this, but one place I, I just find this really beautiful is in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and so uh, I'm just going to turn to Matthew 5 to 7 for a moment. I won't read it all. I'll just summarize it. But, but if you're familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, uh, it is kind of Jesus' moment where he teaches his disciples about what following him will look like. He talks to them about how they relate to God, how they're to relate to money, how they're to relate to others, all of these things. But what I want us to see just in these minutes is, is the beautiful structure that this sermon has. Because it actually has what you can see on the screen as almost like a pyramid structure to it. And so firstly, on, on either side, you have the introduction and the conclusion. Simple, straightforward enough. Then you kind of come up a level, and just after the introduction, Jesus gives six examples of how to live right with God, how to obey his word and live right by him. And then corresponding to that on the other side, just before the conclusion, he gives six teachings on how to live right by the world, how to live right with money and how to live right with other people. But then as you kind of come towards the center, Jesus begins to talk about spiritual practices. He talks about three big ones in particular, giving, praying, and fasting. But then, in the, kind of, in the middle of this discussion, he breaks and he gives his people a prayer. Right at the center of the center of the center is the Sermon of the Sermon on the Mount, is Jesus giving his disciples a prayer to pray. 
We call it the Lord's Prayer. It will be familiar to many of us, but I'm just going to read it out for us here. Matthew 6, verses 9, Jesus says, Therefore you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Those words I've just prayed there will be familiar, I imagine, to many of us. We might have even prayed them since childhood. And yet, this is, for Jesus, the center of what the Christian life should look like. When Jesus is summarizing what following him will look like, what is the thing right at the center? It is prayer. It is coming to our Father, enjoying his glory, praying for it to be known, and bringing our needs to him. For Jesus, prayer is not a negotiable in the Christian life. It's not kind of up there with going to church and uh, kind of doing good works and other things, going to life group. No, no, for Jesus, right at the center, right at the kind of the thing that makes it all work, is prayer. Let me just say that if you're a Christian here this morning, this is what Jesus has invited you into. Jesus didn't come just so that you could know that you'll get to heaven when you die. Jesus came actually so that you could know heaven now. So that you could daily experience life with your Father. So that you could carry all the things you carry, but do it with kind of a lightness and joy because you do it with him. And actually what the Sermon on the Mount is really about is Jesus kind of creating his community. And what's the sort of community Jesus wants to build? What's the church that he wants to establish? It is a people built on prayer. This is what Jesus has come to give us. He's come to restore us to his place. And that's actually exactly what we see at the end of Jesus' life. On the cross, we see Jesus go through his death so that we could know his life with God. Just to summarize the gospel for you, if you've never heard it before, it's that Jesus has died in our place. Died for our sin, died for our mess. Why? So that we could live in his place. So that we could have his loving, joyful, abundant relationship with the Father. This is what he has won for us. This is what he has called all of us to. But here's the thing. Even as I describe that, I think some of us, maybe even many of us, will be thinking, that's not my experience. I've been a Christian for many, many years, and yet I've never known what you're talking about. You know, we, I try to pray, but I struggle to, to find the time to fit it in. Or if, if I find the time to fit it in, I kind of struggle to, to know what to do when I'm, be, when I'm there. I struggle to find the motivation to keep going. I kind of stiffen up, not sure what words to say. It's all a bit, bit awkward. In one book on prayer I've read, it says that prayer should be like having dinner with an old friend. A beautiful image, but I've certainly had experiences in my life where it's more like my conversation with the corner shop owner when I go in to get milk. It's like, hello, here's what I'd like. I don't know, here's what I owe you. Okay, thanks very much, bye. And it's like, get out as soon as possible. Just not sure how to interact in this situation. No richness, no joy, it's just kind of functional. That's how we can often feel in prayer. But here's the thing. If that is where we are, if you would say this morning, Simon, I, I want to pray, but I don't know where to start. I just, on our last point here, just want to read out some of the most, for me, comforting verses in the Bible. And they come from uh, Luke chapter 11. In Matthew's Gospel, we saw Jesus give the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke, he does it again in a slightly different form. But before he gives his disciples the prayer, uh, we see them ask him something. In Luke 11, verse 1, 
says this, he was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. For me, I think this is one of the best verses in the Bible. Why? Because it shows us that prayer is something we learn. Prayer, yes, is something we were made for. Prayer, in some ways, is something that is naturally inbuilt into us. But it doesn't mean that as soon as you come to Jesus, your prayer life will be amazing. No, no. Even for his own disciples, they said, Jesus, will you, will you teach us how to do this? Prayer is like anything else worth doing in life. It is something that takes practice. It is something that we must learn to do step by step. And so here is why it's really comforting. It means this, that if you struggle with prayer, if you find prayer hard, then that's normal. It's normal to find things hard before you've practiced them. It's normal to find things hard when you're kind of in the early stages. This verse says, learning to pray is what we all must do. But here's what's even better. In verse 2 of that same passage, Jesus replies, and he says to them, whenever you pray, say this. Jesus doesn't respond to them saying, oh, you guys really should know how to pray by now. It's like the basic thing, and you can't even do that. Nor does he say, well, here's how I pray. I get up at five o'clock, make myself a black coffee, coffee, walk up into the mountains, and then have this wonderful time with God and come down three hours later rejuvenated. It's like, oh, great. <laughs> I'm not sure I can do that. No, no, what does Jesus do? He literally gives them a 20-second prayer to pray. That's how long it takes to pray the Lord's Prayer, about 20 seconds. And he says, th this is your doorway in. He said, you want to learn to pray? Okay, I'm going to come right down to where you are, and this is your first step. It's the gospel in miniature, isn't it? Jesus comes down to where we are so that he can lift us up to where he is. And it starts with just praying his prayer. And so, church, what we're going to do over this series is we are going to just simply come to Jesus and let him teach us how to pray. And we're going to do that uh, in one sense in our normal way, through kind of on Sundays, just having teaching from his word that will kind of inspire us and give us a vision for prayer. But we're also going to do something a little bit different this series. Because what we need if we want to learn to pray is not just knowledge, not information, it's practice. <laughs> The way you learn to pray is by praying. And so what we're going to do is that every week as we go through this series, we are going to invite you to take up a new prayer practice into your daily lives. We're going to learn to pray together by praying together. And I want to make clear right at the start here, what I'm about to share is an, an invitation it's not a command. I kind of the, the way we've designed this is kind of, you know, up to our wisdom. It's not kind of some routine that's come from the Bible that you must obey if you're a Christian. No, no. This, is, this is optional. <laughs> this is our recommendation. This is an invitation. And so if for any reason you feel, actually, I, I'm just not in the right headspace right now to kind of go on this journey, that is, that is absolutely fine. Just come and enjoy <laughs> this series as we go through it together. But... We are actually really excited about this term because the way we've designed these prayer practices to work is a bit like Couch to 5K. Uh, has anyone ever done Couch to 5K? Happy to, yeah, a few people. It's kind of this uh, routine that if you kind of need to start running again or start running for the first time, it will take you on kind of increment by increment up from not running at all all the way to running 5K and enjoying it a really achievable kind of framework to get you running and enjoying it. And in the same way, what we hope to do over this term is start with just some very simple prayer practices, build on them week by week, so that by the end, we are l learning to pray. But not only that, we're enjoying prayer. 
And so the way this is going to work is that after each Sunday message, uh, we're going to share a kind of new prayer practice for that week. If you ever miss a Sunday or just need a reminder, Phoebe uh, has put together a wonderful course that can be found on our website. You can also, we'll also email it out to you this afternoon so everyone has access to it. Uh, and just on each of these weeks, we're going to just give a new prayer practice. And the one for this week, we're just going to start really, really simply. We're just going to pray the Lord's Prayer once a day. We're not going to kind of add our own words to it just yet. We're not going to kind of pray it multiple times. But just for this first week, our invitation to you, if you want to grow in prayer, begin this kind of couch to 5K with us, is find a time to just pray the Lord's Prayer through. This might feel to some of us very simple. It will be a, a kind of a slow start. You might kind of get to the end of it and think, is that it? Is, are we done? But here's the thing. What we're looking to do here is kind of build a habit of prayer. Build a regular practice in our lives that can slowly grow into a living, breathing relationship with our Father. And so this week, our invitation to you is find a time in your day. Maybe set a reminder on your phone. Make it the same time each day to make it a habit. I would personally recommend doing this sometime in your morning routine, just having it right in there at the start of the day and just take 30 seconds to just still your heart before God and just read, pray through the Lord's Prayer. Now just a word here for some of us, you might be sitting here and thinking, this sounds great, but I'm already running 5Ks in prayer. <laughs> You know, maybe I'm even up to 10Ks or a half marathon. You know, are you asking me to, to kind of lay down my wonderful life of prayer and kind of start from the beginning? Well, no, 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 of, of course we're not. This is all an invitation. And uh, my encouragement to you would be maybe to uh, kind of continue your prayer practices. But maybe you want to think about how you can incorporate this into them. Because the thing is, when you're learning to run... It's helpful to kind of do it on your own and go at your own pace, but it's also helpful to have other experienced people with you who can kind of come alongside you saying, you're doing a great job, Simon. You know, we're, we're doing really well. We've just got a little bit further to go. And so if you're someone here who's thinking, actually, my, my prayer life's good. It's healthy. My invitation, still come and join with us and kind of be those encouragers for all the rest of us as we go on this journey.